Hi everyone, welcome to your library at home. My name is Rebecca, I'm part of the public programs team at the State Library of New South Wales. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that I live and work on Gadigal land, the traditional custodians on this land on which knowledge has been exchanged for millennia. We also celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal culture and language across New South Wales. And I take this opportunity to pay my respects to elders past, present and certainly emerging. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal Australians who may be joining us online this evening. Welcome to another instalment of the B-List Book Club online. Tonight, we are so very pleased to be hosting Bree Lee in conversation with Sarah Dingle to talk on Sarah's book, Brave New Humans. Brave New Humans is available for purchase and delivery through the State Library Bookshop. The State Library Bookshop can be found on the State Library website on our homepage um, and the State Library Bookshop does free delivery. A quick update to all of our audience at home that the library is still closed, but we are hoping very much that Sydney will soon be emerging from this lockdown. And we'll be very excited at that point to be welcoming all of our visitors back on site. In the interim though, the teams across the library are working hard to update our website with content and resources for our audiences. So I do encourage you all to keep an eye on our website for upcoming talks, but to also view the extensive range of previous talks that have been held over 2020 and 2021 that have been recorded and published online. We have author, curator and academic talks and many of our previous B-List book club events also. The B list is a regular in a series, but tonight I'll leave the details of the next talk in this series to be um, announced by Brie at the conclusion of her talk with Sarah. I'll now hand over to Brie to introduce to your screen Sarah with a reminder that we are using the Q&A feature of the Zoom app. So please send through any questions that you may have for Sarah at the, um, throughout the talk and Brie will moderate these at the conclusion of her talk with Sarah. Thanks so much, Brie. Thank you, Beck. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for once again deciding to spend your Thursday night here with us at the B-List Book Club via distance. I would like to second Beck's acknowledgement that we are um, live streaming. Well, I am live streaming to you from my lounge room, uh, which is on Gadigal land in the Eora Nation uh, in Potts Point in Sydney. When I say I acknowledge this is Aboriginal land, always was, always will be, I also want to make it clear that I support the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Tonight's book uh, was I, so affecting. Um, Sarah Dingle has written a story. Her, she's written her story. It is an incredibly powerful combination of memoir and investigative journalism. Norman Swan described it as um, superbly balancing cold fury, grief, and the professional focus of an experienced journalist. The subtitle is The Dirty Reality of Donor Conception. And... To me, this book is everything I ever want from strong nonfiction. It asks the deepest and most critical of philosophical and ethical questions, deeply human questions, and also ethical, moral, legal questions. Um, I would love, I'm, I'm so thrilled that we get to hear from Sarah tonight. Sarah Dingle is a dual Walkley Award-winning investigative reporter and presenter with the ABC, working across radio and TV current affairs. As a journalist, her work for the ABC has also won the Walkley Foundation's Our Watch Award for reporting on violence against women and children, UN Media Peace Prizes, Amnesty Media Peace Prizes, and the Voiceless Media Prize, and the Australian College of Educators Media Prize. In 2010, she was the ABC's Andrew Ollie Scholar. Brave New Humans is her first book. Sarah, are you there? Would you like to join us? Love to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I've asked Sarah tonight to begin by reading us uh, the prologue to her book um, because it's um, it's quite short and it, and it does a beautiful job of explaining, I suppose, how you came to start writing this story. Thank you, Sarah. It was Easter. I brought her flowers and we were sitting in a Vietnamese restaurant metres from Oxford Street on a Saturday night. At 27, I was vaguely aware that there was no longer infinite time. I loved my job. I didn't want children anytime soon, but I didn't want all options to vanish while I filed stories. My mother's not always my first port of call for advice, but she has lived a lot longer and she had me. Mum, you know how you had me late? 
I said cautiously. Did you have any problems conceiving me? Her eyes flickered. My mother was in her 60s. She is Malaysian Chinese with short salt and pepper hair. Why do you ask, Sarah? Because, I explained, aware it was an unusually personal question between us, because I don't know if I want to have children now or at all. And I was wondering how late to leave it, if there was a deadline I should know about such a journalist. She moved in her seat. Maybe this isn't the right time to tell you, shrug. But your father is not your father. What? You're joking, aren't you? I said. No, we had, we had problems conceiving and it turned out your father couldn't. So we used a donor. What? You're joking. Mum, are you joking? No, no, half a beat. But the only difference it makes, she said quickly, a burst to finish what she had to say, the only difference it would make to you at all is your medical history, knowing your medical history, that's all. Because your father is your father. He loved you like his own daughter. You couldn't ask for a better father. He was a fantastic father to you. My mother now looked anxious. It doesn't make a difference, does it, Sarah, she said. I felt like the pressure in the room had dropped. The lights and walls were very yellow and other sounds had faded. My brain danced around what she just told me, refusing to engage. In that pause, something happened. It's hard to be completely in the moment when you're a journalist. Some external self is always standing at a distance, nodding, noting. And so, despite my shock, I'd automatically picked up the flow of power in the conversation. This was a moment when her guard was down. She wasn't actually asking me. She wanted reassurance and she needed to hear it straight away. I wanted to scream, to rip the tablecloth off, to smash something, to go to the bathrooms and cry. No, I said, it doesn't. That was my first lesson in what it's like to be donor conceived. Your feelings about the whole business come last. Thank you, Sarah. You wrote shortly after that prologue that um, the sort of emotional journey you went through immediately after finding out the news, um, you, you referred to it that you subsequently learnt that those there were common emotional stages um, that lots of people who find out later in life that they are donor conceived go through. Can you talk us through what that those phases or stages of realizations are like? Sure. I mean, if, uh, if I had perhaps a lot more money and time, I would make a pamphlet for donor conceived people. <laughs> and it would be like the seven stages of finding out that the donor conceived. Um, there's disbelief, uh, shock, disbelief, they intertwine, rage that comes in and comes out. Um, there's relief as well as disbelief for a lot of people um, who, I mean, none of these stages are um, mandatory, shall we say, but it's quite common that you'll, you'll experience a range of them. And the relief for many people comes from never quite feeling that things made sense or never quite fitting in or being the only non-sporty one in the family or, you know, like stuff like that. And all of a sudden it's like, ding, this mm. is why. Um, and grief, I think grief is a really common one. Um, and fear um, and sometimes loss, which is different to grief because it, it's, um, you're losing your sense of self. And sometimes if you have grown up with siblings, sometimes there is loss there too, because all of a sudden your siblings might not be the siblings that you thought they were. They might only be half siblings. You might be suddenly separated um, in ways that you don't even understand. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that happens and the pamphlet would probably be like that. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be my mm. answer. Um 
what what you just mentioned then about relief was also one of my early questions there you tell the stories of a few people in this book where they find out quite late in life that they've been conceived with donor sperm but and their first response is uh, like I told you so or I knew it like yeah. a, a, but really a sense of um, a perpetually long-held suspicion being confirmed yeah um, and uh, I, I am not one of those people so I'm here to tell you that it's perfectly common for you never to suspect to have no inkling whatsoever um, and when you find out the truth that's shattering but then there are other people who always feel a little on the outer um, in ways that simply being a teenager or, you know, other life circumstances do not fully explain. And for those people, I think this news either immediately or further down the track relieves some pressure. Mm. One other book um, that I've read and I was able to inter uh, interview the author of for Sydney Writers Festival last year was Danny Shapiro about her book called Inheritance. And um, it's a memoir of Danny finding out after both her, both her parents have passed away that she was conceived with donor sperm. And I was very shocked reading your book, the way you describe looking in the mirror and regarding your own face and having a sort of a gap or a sense of distance there was almost identical to the way she described the feeling of, of looking in the mirror. Um, can you talk a bit about when you're in this time of um, sort of the first period of time after finding out this news, the shift or overlap that happened between you as an individual grappling with that information, but also you as a journalist? starting to grapple with that information and it becoming uh, uh, the beginning of an investigation? Sure. So when I first um, found out the truth, I was not capable of any journalism at that point. Um, so I, it, I, I just fell into a hole um, because, you know, at 27 I had already formed an identity as an adult and then it was just like we'll take that and we'll smash it um and uh um something I should explain is that the man who raised me who I still call dad he actually died when I was 15 and so it was like losing him all over again it was like just my own identity was shattered and also I had lost him again because he wasn't mine in the first place. So it was a really hard time um, and it took some months to, to get past the rawness. But once it did, I started to realise that I already had, um, perhaps naively I thought, all the tools at my disposal that I needed to fix this and that was I could investigate um, and what I found was far worse than anything I had ever expected and um, I do feel in the end that that initial suspicion that I had the tools to fix this that was correct but holy hell it was tough. <laughs> mm. um, I want to talk a lot about the industry and about that sort of what you uncovered um, during that process. But one, in one of the earliest chapters, before you really get into that, you take us right back to 1770 and one of the first ever examples of artificial insemination. Why start there? And what's so relevant about Dr. John Hunter and the sort of, I guess, the, the origins of these types of procedures? I think when people think about donor conception, they assume that this is a modern uh, practice and therefore any issues associated with it are modern concerns and probably confined exclusively to same-sex relationships. And that is completely wrong. Um, donor conception has been practiced in a clinical setting in the West for more than 100 years. And in Australia, it has been offered by doctors 
in a clinical setting for almost 80 years. And for almost all that time, it has only been available to heterosexual couples because you had to uh, front up with your partner of the opposite sex and in many cases prove that you were actually married before they would allow you access to this procedure. So um, when I talk about issues in donor conception, I'm talking about um, some very deep rooted problems. And I thought it was impo important to start with Dr. John Hunter, because as I you know, explain in my book, it takes a while through twists and turns before we get to the technology and the techniques that are used today. But the common thread throughout this history is just this kind of careening disregard for the consequences of any of these procedures, either further down the line or, in fact, the immediate consequences on the patients themselves. It's very much a history of male doctors going, hey, I've thought of this thing, I'm going to do this thing. And I'm going to do it on this person, sometimes without telling them. And that is how we got to where we are today. Mm. And as I say in my book, in many ways, not much has changed. Mm. And along the process of them doing that thing, they get paid handsomely. They do. <laughs> and incredible careers accrue. Yeah. Um, before we start talking about the, what you found out in the investigation and some of the sort of legal issues, just for people who haven't read the book and maybe are coming to this issue for the first time, can you please explain just some of the basics? For example, what's the difference between ICSI and IVF and what you mean or what we mean in this conversation when we talk about a donor-conceived child? Cool. That's a great question and really important because I sort of have battled my way through conversations, even with close friends, trying to explain what donor conception actually is. Donor conception is not IVF. IVF is simply a technique. It's in vitro fertilization, it's fertilization in glass with the components of life, sperm and eggs. It can be, IVF can be used by two people to create their own biological children, or you can get donors to provide either the sperm or the eggs or both, and that's IVF and donor conception. Um, another medical technique is ICSI, uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is like literally sounds like a Korean horror drama. Um, and this is where you've probably seen the footage. It's the classic kind of um, sperm injected directly into the egg. So egg stabbed with a needle, sperm travels right into the center of the egg, brute forces fertilization with a single sperm chosen by a human lab tech. Um, uh, surrogacy is where a child is, you know, gestated in the womb of uh, a woman who may or may not be the biological mother, but at the end, she, you know, she's only, she's the carrier, but she is not the person, the intended parent, or as I call them, the commissioning parent. She is not the commissioning mother in that scenario. So IVF, surrogacy, ICSI, all these things are techniques but the overarching thing that I'm talking about is donor conception, and that is biological material uh, provided to create children who are not raised by their biological parents. Great, thank you. Um, what did you find out about when you first started making inquiries in terms of what your legal rights were? And I mean you specifically because of like the year that you were conceived. Um, and also because of the state in Australia in which you live? Um, I, so when I first started searching, I wanted to know what I could find out about my donor. And um, the answer was nothing. Um, and one of the first things that shocked me about that answer was I, in fact, was entitled to nothing. Um, so... When I was born, and for many years after that, I was born in the early 80s, um, and there was a law passed in New South Wales in 1984, which for decades was the only law passed in donor conception, which basically said that any child born of a donor 
is not the child of that donor. And I think it literally says, it only refers to donor sperm and it says the child born of donor sperm shall not be fathered by that man or some, some sort of shall not be fathered by that, which is insane because of course he fathered me. I mean, what else did he do? Um, and, and this law basically means that I am not the child of my donor, despite abundant biological evidence to the contrary, and I have no legal right to know his name or, in fact, anything else about him. If the clinic had kept some non-identifying details, um, they might give it to me, but I don't even have a legal right to that. And this situation in my state continued um, until the 1st of January, 2010. So all donor conceived people in New South Wales who were born before the 1st of January, 2010 are in the same situation as me, which means everyone over the age of 11. In the book, you write about Victoria being sort of the best of a bad lot. Can you, yeah. in terms of their legislation, can you explain the differences? And by the way, it is obviously shocking. <laughs> there, I mean, I come from a legal background and there are many areas of law that um, <laughs> seem absurd to be different in different <laughs> states and territories, but this has got to be up there in terms of absurdity of, of being so different, depending on where you are. It's very strange. It's very strange. So there are no federal laws in Australia with regards to donor conception or in fact the fertility industry at all. So federally there's nothing. And then you come down to the state territory level and only half the states and territories have laws governing the fertility industry and the other half have nothing. And if you live in the half that do have laws, um, most of the time, those laws only apply after a certain point, like in New South Wales, after the 1st of January 2010. The standout exception is the state of Victoria, which has been a lot more forward thinking than the rest of the country. So the state of Victoria was um, one of the first jurisdictions in the world in the 80s to introduce the concept of a register. Um, and put donors and donor conceived people on that register. And then uh, first of all, they decided that donor conceived people could have non-identifying information. And then they decided donor conceived people born after a certain point could have identifying information. And then they decided it was uh, actually discrimination to have three different regimes for donor conceived people in Victoria, depending on when they were born. So then they enacted something really quite amazing, um, which is known as Norell's Law, named for a donor conceived person who was a really good mate of mine, actually. Um, and it allows all donor conceived people in the state of Victoria access to identifying information about their biological parent. Like basically you get to know who your dad is or your biological mother or whatever, however you uh, choose to name them, you get to know who they are, finally, um, no matter when you were born. Unfortunately, there are some caveats, and that is where the records exist. We know that fertility clinics have destroyed records with abandon. Um, and the other really big caveat is you have to know you were donor conceived in the first place. And that is still pretty rare. Mm, okay, I want to get to that later um, about whether or not people even know and about parents telling or not telling children. Um, what I want to stick with for now is something you just mentioned about records being destroyed. Can you tell us about um, when you started trying to get access to your own information about the destroyed records and also about how they are not considered your records? Yeah. Funny, hey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I was made... Uh, in a fertility clinic, which was actually a public fertility clinic. Um, it was part of the Royal North Shore Hospital, which coincidentally is where my mother worked as a, as a nurse. So it's all very kind of odd. And um, at this particular clinic and at many other clinics, they decided that the woman being treated was a patient, but the product of that treatment 
was not. So despite the fact that they literally made me on the premises, and in fact, probably no one could be considered more their patient than I was, um, I was not entitled to any records of my conception without my mother's permission because I am not a patient, um, which once again requires a really creative uh, way of, of looking at the legal aspects of this situation, I think. Mm. Um, and what were the stages of realising that the information you had hoped would be in those files mm. when you did finally get access to them was not there where it mm. should have been? Um, so I asked my mother for access to the files, uh, to the files of her treatment and my conception. And at first she refused. And I understand why she refused, um, although I don't obviously agree with anyone refusing that. Um, and when my mother um, and my father were going to these people and possibly even now, because I don't know, doctors were actively telling heterosexual couples to go home, have sex and pretend this whole thing had never happened. Pretend the treatment did not happen. Pretend we have done nothing to you. You were never here. This is your natural child. Um, and if you start from that point, the damage that creates throughout the years is colossal. Um, so my mum initially was like, I, I don't really want you knowing or, or pursuing anything about this. Um, and what changed her mind was breast cancer. She was diagnosed with breast cancer for the second time in her life. And um, after her diagnosis, I said to her mum, I really need to know. Uh, I need to know who my biological family is because I have, I have to manage my own risk with this as well. I'm getting quite a strong history from your side of the family. If there's something on the other side, I really need to know. And at that point she gave me my permission. So I went back to the clinic um, and the public hospital clinic that made me had been subsumed into um, a private entity, which is now the largest fertility industry kind of entity in Australia, is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, um, owns clinics around the country. It's a bit like being made by Coca-Cola. And uh, they said to me, we've dug up your mother's file and the details about your donor have been cut out. And they were literally cut out. So if you look at these files, they're like microfiched A4 pages and there are holes in them. Um, and what was cut out was not the donor's name because they never would have let that anywhere near my mother's file. They were super anxious to preserve the anonymity of the donor. Um, but what they cut out was the donor's code and the code allowed them to see which woman had been inseminated with whom how many siblings had been made, uh, if, there were any, if there were any questions surrounding um, genetic disease, they could go back and, in theory, if the codes were preserved, uh, warn parents of other children made from this donor or, you know, remove that donor from circulation. But if you cut out the code from files of treatment, you can't do any of that. You cannot control for disease transmittable disease, and you cannot control for vast litters of siblings. And to this day, no one has given me a satisfactory answer as to why doctors did that. Can you talk to us about sibling limits? And in hand in hand with that, the frankly absurd idea of trusting the industry to self-regulate, which seems to be the answer that's just given all the time as to how this type of thing could keep happening. So um, in the four states and territories that have laws on the fertility industry, there are family limits uh, set out in law, this thing called family limits, which is basically the number of donors, uh, the number of families that an individual donor is allowed to donate to. Um, and even when set out in law, it's quite strange. New South Wales has a limit of five 
I think that's quite a lot. Um, imagine if your dad came to you and said, um, I've got four other families uh, just down the road. <laughs> um, you might want to go and check in with these other women that I've been sleeping with as to how many siblings you have. Um, so five families is a lot, right? But that's actually quite good in the scheme of things. In Victoria, the limit is 10. Uh, in other states, the limit is, like the standard is 10, which is just, I think that is incredibly and also, sorry, it's not just 10, for anyone listening, it's not just 10 children conceived, it's 10 families. Yep. Yep. So if each of those families wants to have three kids um, and they all want to use the same donor, so their siblings are full siblings, which is a nice idea in itself, don't get me wrong, that's good, but suddenly you're looking at 30 donor-conceived siblings and these rules obviously cannot control for the social relationships that a donor will have in their personal life because no one can stop you from like marrying someone else right or you know entering a long-term relationship with someone else so there might be more than 10 families um and then we get to the fact that even when these limits have been laid out in law even in the supposedly best regulated state of victoria they have been broken and in the case of the state of victoria in at least one instance broken more than three times over, which is to say more than 30 families created from a single sperm donor. And that is a lot of siblings. And that is that is such a travesty that I, you know, how is that in any way in the best interests of the child? It was shocking to read as well that, um, that even the states that do have these limits and laws, it doesn't seem to be able to stop um, sperm that has been donated passing between clinics or passing into the state, which, and then because there's no national register, there could be more than 10 families in multiple states and territories. That's correct. Clinicians trade sperm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, this book, I, uh, every page, there was something that I was just so shocked and disappointed to to read is still going on. Um, your, can you talk about the um, testimony that you gave at one of the review processes, the, the New South Wales one, um, that was obviously very difficult for you, but it sounded like it was very effective or was certainly affecting. Yeah, this was, um, this was a parliamentary inquiry into um, what I thought was just a minor issue in the um, crazy world of donor conception. It was about um, having, you know, parents on a birth certificate. Mm. Um, and it, you know, there had been a media hoo-ha about a court case involving a donor and a same-sex couple. And so parliament had decided to hold an inquiry and um, I turned up to tell them that there were bigger problems afoot than this one thing um, that had, you know, spawned a bunch of op-eds. Um, and it was at a point where I hadn't actually told many people in my life at all that I was donor conceived. And all of a sudden I'm fronting up to New South Wales Parliament. I have to interview these politicians as part of my day job. And I'm gonna tell them something extremely personal about myself that I, I I didn't even really have words for yet. Um, so I, you know, rode the lifts and I entered this room and the committee predictably was entirely male. Um, it was a room of men and then like a few staffers, all the staffers were female um, and all the, all the men, uh, the politicians were male, the people with power were male. And I thought, oh my God, I'm here to kind of rage against um the machine against sperm donors. <laughs> yeah. sorry how's this gonna go good one yeah. Sarah uh, <laughs> um and I sort of I opened my mouth to start speaking and I went <laughs> and my voice just went <laughs> um and I started to cry and I was like oh good and now they're gonna think I'm crazy um so I sort of got my way through going <laughs> and and you know um and they were really great and it was one of the few kind of bright points on this journey um 
it really it gave me faith in the political system, um, which is not something a journalist says very often, but mm. these people treated me with respect and with kindness. And after I'd sort of, you know, downloaded some pretty, uh, frankly, crazy sounding stuff, um, they just looked at each other and the oldest politician in the room, like this kind of hawk-like guy with lots of white hair, and he just went, oh, well, I think, I think she should know who he is. And all the other men were like, yeah, yeah, and that was amazing, you know? Um, so I, yeah, it was, it was one of the, yeah, as I say, it was one of the bright points. Mm. Something that really comes through reading the book um, because you sort of track like that sort of that particular um, parliamentary inquiry and there are others like different types of reviews and inquiries and commissions or whatever, these processes where um, people are invited to make submissions and submissions are often made by people who are donor conceived and occasionally you get um, submissions made by people who have donated their material. Um, but consistently, it seems that it's the fertility industry who are the most vocal and very committed and very strong, borderline aggressive opponents to any degree of, um, uh, um, how would you describe it? To any degree of like transparency, de trans <laughs> yeah, basically, um, but also specifically like de-anonymizing um, of donors. Can you talk a bit about the, um, I suppose the sort of irony there around the stats that you found about how actually de-anonymizing that process encourages donors compared to this, I guess, convention what conventional wisdom that if you force donors to um, be identified, that people will stop donating, that that's the kind of um, bo bogeyman that the industry claimed to be afraid of? Yeah, that's right. So whenever anyone raises the spectre of why don't we let these people know who their biological parents are, there's this kind of, oh, but if we do that, donors will never donate again and then people can't make families and ah. Uh, um, and that's a very, I suppose, readily understandable, kind of, it's, it's an argument that has a lot of kind of, it sticks, mm -hmm. but it's completely untrue. Um, because to, know if removing anonymity affects donor numbers. You actually need to know the numbers in the first place and you need to be able to compare the before and after. And in 2016, three academics, Australian academics, actually did that in an international law journal. And they obtained the data of, uh, I think, around about 40 of the 80 fertility clinics in Australia at that point, um, major and minor. And they looked at, um, donor numbers for those clinics. So in 2005, there was an ethical guideline brought in by the National Health and Medical Research Council, which is in the absence of law, the only thing that kind of, you know, provides any sort of framework for the facility industry. And in from 2005 onwards, the NHMRC said, you should not use donors unless they are prepared to be identified to their offspring once the offspring turn 18. And if clinics don't abide by NHMRC ethical guidelines, they're not supposed to be accredited. So this in theory was, you know, important. This, this should have been followed. Um, some states already had laws which said donors have to be known to their children once the children turn 18, if the children wish it. Um, and one of those states was the state of Victoria. So we have a bunch of Australian states which had total anonymity, do whatever you like, pre-2005. And then after 2005, they're supposed to stop doing that and collect details, no more anonymity. And then you have the state of Victoria, which is the control because there's already uh, a lack of anonymity. It changes nothing in Victoria. And if you look at the time period sort of 10, 11 years around 2025 to 2011, 2012, um, the trend is one way and it's up. The number of donors increases. The number of donors increases after 
the removal of anonymity and the number of donors in Victoria increases as well. Everything's going up. Um, so you cannot possibly argue that forcing donors to reveal their true selves to their children who they choose to make has a detrimental effect on the numbers of donors who will come forward. And this should not have been surprised because this phenomenon had already been observed in the UK, which removed anonymity across the country by law from 2005. Mm. Um, I just want to remind everyone for watching, I've only got about 10 more minutes maximum. I can't believe how fast this has gone um, with Sarah and then I'll be taking audience questions um, and you can type them into the Q&A box. I have to get to this because it made me so mad. Um, and amongst a book full of shocking revelations was truly upsetting. Um, can you talk a bit about this recurring phenomena of doctors using their own sperm without women knowing? Women sign up for um, the procedure thinking that they will receive um, anonymous sperm donor sperm and that is not what happens. This uh, practice, shall we say, of doctors as donors has been documented around the world. Um, and as I reveal in my book, it has also happened on multiple occasions in Australia. So whenever we hear about this in Australia, which is not very often, it tends to be kind of like sensationalized as this weird thing that happened once in Belgium or something. Um, but in fact, it has happened here. And the, the lack of transparency is the only thing from preventing us, which is preventing us from discovering more instances of this yeah. happening. Um, and it happens with disturbing frequency. It happened like there's a gigantic list of it occurring in states sort of dotted across the US. It has happened in Canada. Uh, it has happened in the UK. It has happened in South Africa. It has happened in Germany. It has happened in the Netherlands. It has happened in Belgium. Um, all these countries, including Australia, which is supposedly, you know, um, wealthy and well set up and, you know, trust us, we're doctors. It has happened. And the only thing that you can say, I guess, is that they clearly thought they would never be found out. What they do is either in the absence of having enough sperm or maybe just because they want to, they use their own sperm to inseminate their unwitting and therefore their unconsenting patients. And it is in fact on such a scale that um, in my book, I talk about uh, an academic in the US who is writing a book on all of this and has developed a quite a profound theory on, on the consequences of this act because it's so common in the US. Um, and she talks about the three penetrations, uh, which is really quite full on, um, but it's, it's basically trying to uh, clearly set out the ways in which this is a violation First of all, obviously, there's a penetration which happens when you are inseminated with something that you don't consent to be inseminated with. And then there's the second penetration, which is when that uh, material takes root in your body. Uh, and then the third is the rest of your life, where you are raising a child that you probably love very much. But this terrible thing has been done to you to make that child. And you know, you can love your child to the ends of the earth, but it doesn't make what was happened, what did, what happened to you okay. And that's just the mother. There are many don't conceive people now who have come forward because they have realized to their own horror that their biological father was their mother's gynecologist or fertility specialist. And there's one horrific case which has come to light recently, which is a donor conceived woman who realized that her biological father was her mother's gynecologist. And by the point she realized, he was also her own gynecologist. Her own biological father had examined her intimately without her ever knowing who he really was. There's no possible way she could have consented to that. 
and like the, the the scale of the transgression is just it's mind blowing. In what universe do these people think this is all okay? It seems to be um, a particularly egregious but natural endpoint of an industry in which there is no transparency and the people who make incredible amounts of money and professional kudos um, are, are, are rewarded for being mini gods. It's, it's, it just, um, it's somehow both surprising and, and, and unsurprising given the way the rest of, of the industry and the people in it have been able to operate um, for so many years. Um, I will really want to give you an opportunity, the final two questions, um, to talk about the work you've been doing. Um, so my final two questions, the first one is, um, and this is about what you um, are sort of advocating for and what your opinion on the industry is now and what it should be. Towards the very end, you speak with a man who, whose name you refer to as Matt, who is donor conceived. Um, and he speaks about wanting the entire industry shut down. Um, can you explain why um, some donor conceived people feel that way and, and sort of, I suppose, where along that spectrum you sit? Sure. Um, so there's, as you would expect, a wide range of views on this amongst donor conceived people. Um, Matt was made by, um, his donor was someone called uh, Dr. Papa, who paid his way through medical school in the US essentially with his donations of sperm and was at one point investigated by a current affairs program in the 90s, I believe, who um, said he could have fathered up to 500 children. Um, Matt himself is uh, the head of a, a network in the US for donor conceived people. And he, as you would expect, has thought a lot about these issues um, and he's got his own kids. And he said to me in one of our first ever interviews that um, he doesn't see how donor conception can ever be done ethically. He said, even if, you know, there are experts who put in lots of safeguards and so on, he doesn't see how it can ever be done in a way that's not treating him like a pet or a dog. Um, and he thinks the whole thing should be banned. He doesn't understand how people can create biological children that they don't see every day um, or you know, care for in that constant way that parents care for their children. Um, and Matt, I should say, has actually made contact with his biological father now and they have a reasonable relationship, which is, you know, a long way from um, when I first interviewed him back in 2015, fast forward six years and they're kind of buddies. Um, but he still feels that way. And a lot of donor conceived people feel that way, that the exploitation is so fundamental to this industry and to this practice that it cannot be made right. Um, the point where I sit on that spectrum is I understand, I understand that feeling of it can never be right because there's so much wrong with this. Um, some, days, some days I just feel that it's all pretty messed up. But unfortunately, I think, A, the genie is out of the bag um, in terms of the techniques and the technology and B, same-sex couples face a different um, sort of set of obstacles to having a child to heterosexual couples. And if we ban all donor conception, that merely drives the practice underground. And we see what happens with it now when it's in theory overground and it's not good. So I think we need to find a way to regulate it. And I think the laws should be constructed in deep consultation with the products of this industry, donor conceived people themselves. 
um, because we've had more than a century of people deciding things for us and look where we are. Can you, this is my final question for you and I'm, um, as you answer, I'm just gonna start um, filtering through the audience questions of which there are plenty already. Thank you, everyone. Um, Sarah, can you talk about the group that you're a part of who um, sort of, I suppose, had the opportunity to speak to the UN and, and state your case and I guess the sort of core principles that you're fighting for together? Sure. Um, in 2019, I was part of the first ever group of donor conceived and surrogacy born people to speak at the United Nations in Geneva. And we were there at a conference to mark the 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the most successful, widely ratified human rights treaty in history. And we basically rocked up uh, to uh, the UN to tell them that in this age of biotechnology, the rights of the child are being trashed. Um, Article three of the Convention on the Rights of the Child says the rights of the child and the welfare of the child should be paramount, should be a primary consideration in all actions concerning children. And straight off the bat, I can tell you, and I think, you know, um, it's obvious from some of the stuff I've said here tonight, that that is, that is never front and center in donor conception. Um, the convention also contains the right to identity, the right to family and to preserve family relations. Um, you know, these really fundamental things, which by design are excluded from donor conception from the get-go. Um, and also most importantly, all children have a right not to be bought or sold. So why do we have a massively profitable fertility industry? Uh, with, you know, donor conception providing kind of the final safety net, if you like, the last procedure that these clinics can sell, when all else has failed, they can say, you've still got this. And that's what we are. We are kind of their, their Trump marketing card, in a way, and there is nothing that is protecting us in that situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of really wonderful questions. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, there's a question here from Amy, which I'm going to read, but then dismiss for a specific reason. Amy is curious to know um, if Sarah has found any further siblings since the book was published. Um, I've deliberately not asked Sarah about the sort of, I suppose, second half slash final third of her own personal journey of finding out about her family history um, because it's an incredible book and I think you should all read it um, to find that out for yourselves. There is a question here um, and it was also one of mine that I'm bummed we didn't get to. Um, are donors paid and are they carefully matched to the couple? Specifically the paid point. Can you talk a little bit, Sarah, about um, that I suppose, pretty big gaping loophole <laughs> about what sort of can't, they, they can't be paid, but they can be reimbursed, like all of that stuff is very relevant. So in Australia, they're not supposed to be paid, but, um, <laughs> 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 uh <-huh. laughs> um, they can be reimbursed for expenses and expenses is not defined. So, um, you could be reimbursed for travel costs. You could be reimbursed for uh, medical expenses, okay? But you can also be reimbursed for lost wages and you can have childcare covered uh, while you undergo these treatments. And um, a number of years ago, as I say in my book, there was one clinic in Australia that was actually offered, offering a, uh, an all expenses paid holiday in Australia for Canadian sperm donors, where they would also get an allowance each day on top of like flights and accommodation and stuff just for wanking in a cup. And um, there's a fundamental difference between male donors and female donors. Um, so sperm donors do what they do. And I mean, you know, you do you, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of, of what gets you off, but it doesn't hurt them, right? It doesn't hurt to donate. Um, but for women donating eggs, it's very different. Um, donating eggs involves injection of hormones to stimulate. In fact, 
hyperstimulate the ovaries to produce much more eggs than you normally would in a menstrual, menstrual cycle, and then extraction. So for women, donating comes with an element of risk and pain. Um, and so consequently, the amounts paid to women in Australia for their eggs tend to be higher. Um, but in the case of both men and women, it's quite possible to be paid money for your stuff that bears no relation to any expense you have actually incurred. Um, so for instance, there was a clinic that was offering a flat five, five grand for eggs. Well, why? I mean, wh what? Everyone gets five grand, but what about, what, what about expenses? <laughs> um, do you know what I mean? Like, so there's that. Um, but on top of that, clinics also import material and they will import material from say the US where people can be paid. And in many cases, in most cases, paid more than in Australia. I mean, there are Craigslist ad for, ads for eggs in the US for up to like 100,000 American. Um, it's, it's a market and it is a very lucrative market for some. I'm going to combine two of these next questions. One's from Sophie and one's from a um, unnamed attendee. Sophie asks, um, she says, thanks, Sarah, the more donor conceived people speaking out, um, the better. If you had a magic wand and could make one change to improve outcomes for donor conceived people, current or future, what would it be? And I'm going to combine that with the other question, which is what now? How do we get laws made to help donor conceived people? And I'm wondering if maybe this is a great opportunity for you to talk about um, how much better we are at legislating around adoptive, like children who are adopted and how that provides some pretty obvious sort of starting points for how we could make improvements for donor conceived people. Yeah. Um, if I had a magic wand, the thing that I would do would might be a bit different to the legislative approach. Oh, because, okay. <laughs> because it's magic, right? Mm. Um, so I would, if I had this magic wand, I would wave it and I would instantly allow all donor conceived people everywhere, whatever age they are, to know not only who their biological parents are, but all their biological siblings. And this, because of the length of time that this has been practiced, this would include grandparents, um, because I believe that we all deserve those answers. Um, but that's magic, let's talk law. So in, in legal terms, um, having some sort of national regulation of donor conception is really important. Um, and having a national register of donors is really important. And that's something that um, is supported by some donors themselves and you know, people who are more on the, the parent side of things, either biological parents as donors or commissioning parents, they wanna see a national register because they want certainty for their kids. That's great, but we can't just have that prospectively going forwards. We need to have regulation for everyone who already exists and laws for everyone who already exists. So we need to immediately act to preserve all donor conceived records. They need to be held centrally, not by fertility clinics, but by government. All birth certificates should have biological truth on them, as well as social parents. And I know that's going to upset a lot of people. And to be honest, I don't really care because it's not about parents. It's about children. And it's about being able to keep yourself safe. If you know who your siblings are, for instance, then you will never accidentally have sex with them. And that's, that's the kind of thing that donor conceived people have to live with, this terror of, if I don't know who my family is, how do I know that I'm not gonna have a child with my half sibling? How do I know I'm not gonna die from preventable disease? Both those things have happened to donor conceived people in Australia. Thank you. Um... A question from Wendy is about whether there's any literature regarding the disclosure of conception method or biological parentage. Um, I would love for you to answer that and also maybe mention about, um, I found it very interesting to read that there were such different rates of whether parents told children that they were donor conceived if they were in same sex or single parent versus heterosexual parent relationships. Sure. So um, by literature, I assume 
you mean like studies on what people do and not books that explain donor conception to kids because apparently there are a lot of those I don't know I'm not really their target market um but uh yeah so peer-reviewed studies on how commissioning parents tell the truth or if they tell the truth do exist quite a lot of them um around the world and what we find is that the biggest liars in donor conception are heterosexuals and they lie because they can because logically if you are raised by a man and a woman and no one ever says anything you're not going to assume that at some point they like rung in an egg um you're going to think that the people who raised you are your biological parents even if you might have like a spidey sense tingling somewhere as some donor conceived people seem to um and studies show around the world that for the donor conceived children of heterosexual couples up to 90 percent of those donor conceived children will be lied to, to about the very fact of their being donor conceived which is astonishing and rates vary so some countries are worse than others um i remember looking at one particular study in i believe it was finland um which really showed how self-limiting these studies are right because if you're never going to tell your donor conceived child the truth about themselves why would you even participate in a study on whether you're going to do that or not you just wouldn't right um so i think the true numbers are probably actually much worse but in finland um the researchers were describing the process of contacting commissioning parents of donor conceived people um, to ask them whether they had told their children the truth and they said you know we got this many responses back this many declined to take part and i think two responded <laughs> two responders actually burned our letter we found out later um so it, it's yeah it's quite full on <laughs> Um, and this instinct to lie may be because it seems easier and you want to preserve whatever um, thing you've created, but I think that just creates more problems for everyone in the long run. It's not fair to your kids. And also, I don't think burning letters is really a sign of anything healthy. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, thank you so much to everyone. We have just a huge number of, of um, very deep questions that are all really wonderful, Sarah. I just want you to know we only have time for one more. Um, and I'm going to take this one from Ross because it's a question I was also left with um, even after finishing reading the book. Why do clinics continue to have so much influence with government and refuse to engage with donor conceived people? Surely it's not purely the money factor. Brackets, I'm sure they don't pay too much tax. Close brackets. Um, well, can't comment on the tax situation. Um, I think money does have a lot to do with it and not just money as you might think of, you know, incoming. Um, I think any time a fertility clinic has to deal with the uh, questions that, the multitude of questions are fielded by a single adult donor conceived person who comes back and goes, what the hell were you doing? Um, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of time taken up dealing and often it's not just one conversation, it's an ongoing conversation because there's a lot to unpick. Um, so time is also money in a way. And that also um, involves a certain amount of reputational risk. So if more donor conceived people knew who they really were and spoke up about it and, you know, managed to talk about the incredibly long and difficult and frankly wacky uh, journey they had to find out anything they could uh, from their fertility clinic, the whole industry would start to look bad, very bad, even worse than it already currently does. Um, so we represent cost and risk. And I think that's why um, they prefer to shut us down. And I, I'm not quite answering your question, Ross, because your question was about why do they wield so much power? And I think another sort of answer to that is establishment. So um, many of the fertility heavyweights have, are men, um, have gone to sandstone universities in Australia. They know politicians, 
They are members of the Order of Australia. They are former governors of the state of Victoria. Uh, they have a lot of shares in the entities that these fertility clinics have become. And, and when you start to draw all those things together, it becomes very, very, very hard for the human products of this industry that sort of get churned out to, um, to reverse anything. Um, that's all we have time for tonight, Sarah. I just wanna thank you so much for putting this together. Um, it is an absolutely damning and devastating indictment of obviously a collective and ongoing failure. I know I speak for a lot of people when I say I, I had no idea. I, I didn't and was shocked um, by so much of what I read. Um, and for anyone who hasn't read the book yet, um, it also does contain a lot more about Sarah's individual story um, that we didn't get to tonight. And it's it's also beautiful writing and deeply affecting. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, and before I forget, um, for regular attendees, next month we are going to be hearing from uh, Chrissy Neen about her latest book, which is a memoir called The Three Burials of Lottie Neen. Uh, Beck from the library um, has assured me that while Sarah and I were chatting, they put the event listing up online. It'll be on the 21st of October. And unfortunately, because of ongoing restrictions, it will also be online only. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you, Sarah. I, I had 50 more questions, um, could speak to you for ages. And um, yeah, thank you for your work and for your generosity in sharing your story tonight. Thank you. I've had a lovely time. Thank you. Wonderful. Good night, everyone.